In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. There's a pretty scary trend that I'm noticing, and that is that there are things that have been proven, that are true, that are factual, that some people still find ways to disagree over. And one of those, believe it or not, that in this day and age, there are still individuals who believe that the earth is flat. I'm glad we didn't laugh at that too hard. <laughs> because I didn't make that one up. And I'm not talking about people who are the, just the conspiracy theorist nuts. You know, the person who is in the basement. Maybe they're still living with their mom in front of the computer, typing away. I'm not talking about people who are afraid to look at a globe. I'm talking about people who actually believe after studying and even earning college degrees that the earth is still flat. Not that the earth is still flat, that the earth always was and always will be flat. And as I began to kind of do research about how people came to these kinds of conclusions, I came across this wonderful video of this woman who proved to this young man, because it's people in their 20s and 30s who are also believing this, even professional athletes are going out there and saying this is true. And what they did is they took this young man out onto the beach, and there was a ship that was going off into the horizon, and they kept in contact with it the entire time. And finally, when the ship passed over the horizon and could not be seen anymore, they radioed out to it. The captain picked up the radio, and they began to talk to him. They said, what's your elevation? Your elevation is still zero. We're at sea level. We have not gone anywhere. And then she asked, have you fallen off of the earth yet? To which the captain replied, not yet. And in doing so, helped to prove to this young man empirically that the thought that he'd had was just completely and utterly mistaken. Today, the church celebrates what I think is a very interesting holiday in the first Sunday after the Epiphany. Because in the Epiphany, you know, we have the, the wise men, the magi, that come to give Jesus these wonderful gifts. And as we talked about last week, the giving of these gifts is an outward sign of Jesus' identity. That he is king of earth and, of course, of heaven. But today, we celebrate something a little strange. John the Baptist has been offering people who've come and heard his voice in the wilderness a baptism of repentance, which is different than the baptism that you and I participated in, which is a baptism of faith in the Holy Spirit, faith in Jesus Christ, and a baptism that makes us members of his body, the church. So that's different than what John was baptizing people for. He was getting people ready for Jesus' ministry. And lo and behold, while John is doing this, he sees somebody come forward. It's Jesus himself. And you have to imagine that this was kind of a double whammy for John, because not only is Jesus the Lamb of God, but Jesus is also his cousin. And there's even a version in the scriptures where John is kind of shakingly nervous, saying, you come to be baptized by me? It should be the other way around. You're the one who's the Lamb of God. I'm not worthy to untie your sandals. But Jesus tells him, just go with it. There's a plan. Trust me. And that plan really has two parts that I want to talk about today. The first one is, Jesus does not need to be baptized. He's sinless. He wasn't born in sin or conceived in sin. He never sinned and never did in his earthly life. So why in the world would a person who has no sin have to be baptized in a baptism of repentance? Well, the reason is this. Jesus is the model of a perfect leader. He doesn't do anything 
He doesn't ask anybody to do anything that he himself will not do first. Some of us have probably had those jobs where the person who has never done the menial task asks us to do that menial task, and we don't always have respect for that person. It's kind of like the philosophy that I learned in seminary and try to practice here. I don't try to ask anybody to do anything that I myself would not be willing to do. That's why so many people have had really funny encounters of me trying to fix a toilet or lay mulch or pretty any menial, pretty much any menial task. Just come out and watch and you'll have a good time. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't just talk about repentance, he models it. He tells people, listen to John. This is important. And so he models the repentance that he's going to ask other people to follow. But it's deeper than that. Jesus is going to ask people to participate in the baptism that he's bringing, which is a baptism of faith. If you can imagine the, the Jordan River, which, by the way, whenever you go to Israel, if you go to Israel, for those of you who've been, you know this already, the Jordan River is disappointing. Because when you go, if you're like me, you have this image in your mind of this big flowing river, and then you get there and it's, you know, not wider at one point than this aisle right here, and it's brown, and it's really cold, so if you go in, you ask yourself, why would anybody put their head underneath this? But Jesus puts his head underneath the waters and comes out the other side. It's kind of like when you're teaching a kid to swim. How many people here ever had to teach a kid to swim? That takes a lot of trust. Because my children, when I was teaching them to swim, would not put their head under water, no matter how many times I modeled it for them. Why? they're afraid they're going to drown. It's not natural to put our heads under water. And so Jesus, when he puts his head underneath that water, he's modeling that this is what is the appropriate thing to do. But the symbolism is even deeper. We're being baptized with Jesus into his death and resurrection. When we go into the water and we submerge ourselves completely in that water, we're submerging ourselves in that death. And when we come out the other side, we're rising to eternal life, just as he promised. Now it's hard for us to sometimes really tap into that image, because our baptismal font is, shall we say, smaller. And although some of the children will argue that I've tried to drown them, I have not in their baptism. But that's the outward sign. The outward sign is that water in our head coming underneath it. It's the coming out the other side. And so Jesus wants to model that with his death and resurrection. The second reason I think that he models it, which is the other part, is that he knows that human beings are afraid. We need to be led to places that are unfamiliar. We won't naturally go someplace, most often won't naturally go someplace we haven't been before, or that we're afraid we might get hurt. And so Jesus is telling us, I have been where you have been. I have lived the life in your shoes as a human being in the way that you have. I also know what it means to be tempted. It's going to be okay. And so whenever we prepare somebody for baptism in the church, I try to make it explicitly clear that not only has Christ gone ahead of us, but that they're okay to go through it as well. We know that because of the empty tomb. We know that because Christ was raised from the dead. But there's one more dynamic in here that I really hope that we attach ourselves to today. And that's in the last part of the scripture, gospel reading. So take a look real quick at your gospel reading there. After a time of prayer, the Holy Spirit opens the skies up and says, This is my beloved Son 
with whom I am well pleased. Jesus needed that affirmation, I think. He's making his first real appearance on the public stage. He hasn't begun any ministry yet. He's just been living the simple life of a human being as a carpenter, a worker with his family. And God gives him this encouragement to send him on his way to go begin proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. I hope that each one of us believes that at our baptism, God said those same exact words to us. Not that we're the same kind of son as Jesus, but that we're God's children. All of this is a choice. We're all children of God. Every person born is, is made in the image of God. Excuse me. But we have to choose to be a child of God because it's like claiming your inheritance. And so when a person chooses to enter into Jesus' death and resurrection, they're choosing to be a part of God's family. No one can force us to want to be a part of the family. We must choose. But how often, when we're reflecting on this, do we say to ourselves, there's no way that I could be a child of God. I've made too many mistakes. I've committed too many sins. God knows very well what my failings are. So how in the world would He accept me as one of His children? And the answer is easy. Jesus already took care of that for us. Look at that outward sign again. By choosing to believe in Jesus, by choosing to go and submerge our head in that water, to take the risk of death, and coming out the other side and receiving that eternal life, we've made our choice. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of us here don't remember our baptism. I know that I don't. I just always like to brag that I was a very good child and didn't cry, or so the story goes. But today we get to renew our baptismal vows. We get to renew the covenant that we make with God about our faith and that we're willing to follow Jesus, which is important. Because through the rest of Epiphany, it's all about getting to know this wonderful person, Jesus, who's come into the world to love us and to reconcile us to Him, to His Father. And so as we make those promises today and renew them, at the end, I want each one of us to just imagine those heavens opening up and to God saying to each one of you and to me, You are my beloved. I'm well pleased in you. I'm not saying you're perfect. Notice he's pointing at me. I'm not saying you're always right. But I'm saying that you are loved. So let's move all those barriers out of the way and just try to imagine placing our head underneath that water, holding the hand of Jesus as we come out the other side. And as we do, we'll hear that voice say, You are my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Amen.